Okay, so Rika, if I may, I, I would like to, to start uh, this webinar and thanks everyone. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. Today is uh, Thursday, August the 13th, uh, 2020. Uh, my name is Vafa Shams. Uh, I'm uh, the head of YPASS APAC in, um, uh, located in Melbourne. The time in Melbourne is 12 p.m. and uh, my colleague, uh, Jake uh, Burlocker from Lantern Edge, uh, who will be presenting the uh, the Lantern positioning system, is based in Singapore. Hello, good morning to you, Jake. Good morning, Vafa. And your time must be around 10, or just, just a few minutes past 10? Yeah, it's now 10 in the morning. It's a very rainy morning here in Singapore. Fantastic. It's great to have you uh, joining us from Singapore. Uh, I'm, I'm actually quite excited, uh, waiting to go through your presentation. Would love to see how you uh, created the solution. I, I've heard a lot of great things about the uh, Lantern positioning. But uh, before then, I guess uh, I'd just like to take you through some housekeeping. Um, is that the, the, this webinar is expected to last uh, 50 to 60 minutes. Uh, hopefully most of it will be uh, Jake talking. And this webinar will be recorded and the recording link will be sent to you. The presentations, both of the presentations are available in PDF in the handouts. So if you look at the handouts, you, you, you should see both of the presentations there. Uh, feel, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end. Place your questions as shown to the right of the screen. All the questions are anonymous and if we didn't get to cover your question, please contact us directly and all of our contact details are already there. So let me see if I can manage to... Oh, sorry about that. I, I forgot to... <laughs> I forgot to, to show you the, uh, the housekeeping, but it uh, doesn't matter. Okay, so as, as uh, for the agenda, uh, Again, I'm joined over by Jake uh, Burlocker from Lantern Edge, located in Singapore, uh, and together we will cover the following agenda. Firstly, a brief uh, introduction, followed by an overview of Wirepass Mesh technology without going into detailed con technical content due to timing limits. And by the way, if anyone wishes to have a more technical engagement, I'm available to answer your questions via meetings or email. Uh, or whatever other means, and we could refer to, our, or, or you could very much refer to our technical webinars, uh, which we have performed in the past, uh, and they're all posted on our website, and uh, another great resource would be the, the YouTube channel uh, that we have on the Wirepass LTD. And then next, the focus will be on Lantern positioning. Uh, which is what Jake will cover. And I, I, as I said, I'm equally excited to listen in and learn. And finally, we will have a session to address the, the questions which you have listed for us on the side of your screen. So ready, Jake? I'm ready. Great. So here is uh, the introductions. Again, my name is Bafo Shams. Uh, I lead Wirepass in the APAC region, a role that I've had for the last three and a half years. I'm located in Melbourne, Australia. And Jake, may I uh, ask you to make a brief introduction of yourself and also the, uh, the BigMind uh, email address, if you could talk a little bit about BigMind as well. Please. Sure. So uh, my name is Jake Burlocker. Um, originally from Houston, Texas. I started my career in instrumentation and control systems. Um, I actually moved over to Singapore in 2009 with a project with ExxonMobil working on a petrochemical plant. I uh, jumped over to technology about five years ago and have been working for uh, BigMind slash Lantern Edge for the past two years. Uh, so I am a product manager for uh, Lantern Edge and so a uh, Unless you're familiar with what a product manager does, I'm working with the hardware, software, firmware teams, commercial teams, and most importantly, our customers to make sure that uh, you know the feedback that we're receiving from our clients is incorporated into our products and solutions. Uh, to to address the my email address, so actually, BigMind is technically who I work for. Uh, we are a product development company. All of our hardware and solutions that we develop are actually sold under a different company called Lantern Edge. Uh, so that's the that's the difference there. But we're both uh, one and the same. 
Excellent. And uh, I, I just want to make, make uh, one clarification is that even though we pronounce uh, big mind, it's actually a big mind when we write it because I've, I've done a few of those mistakes uh, in the past. So it's actually BIQ. Uh, right, Jake? Yeah, that's correct. With a Q. Fantastic. And then uh, I guess uh, so. Big mind, uh, big mind itself has a, has a tremendous capability in terms of uh, sort of for anyone interested. Uh, it's a fantastic capability in case you're looking to fast track your developments uh, on Wirepass. So, so Jake, they any any queries that people have in regards to fast tracking their development and design. Uh, they could uh, also make those queries to yourself. Yes, that's correct. Um, if anybody has any questions or you know queries, please uh, feel free to email me at the email address listed here. Uh, alternatively, we do have a partner with us at lanternedge.com, uh, which is actually listed later on in the presentation. But I'm always happy to you know discuss with anybody if you have any ideas that you would like to pursue developing. Fantastic. Okay, so let's just uh, get into it. For those who don't know us, Wirepass is a Finnish company with our headquarters in Tampere, Finland. Uh, Wirepass was incorporated in 2010, spinning off from a 10-year research project at the Tampere University of Technology. We are about 50 people with the majority in Finland, but also physical presence in the USA, France, Germany, South Korea, India, and Australia. Uh, Wirepass is extremely active in generation of intellectual properties. We have uh, about 65 patents in 35 families of patent around mesh networking. Uh, our business model is uh, one of software licensing and royalties rather than recurring data charges. And we have uh, over 200 licensees generating north of 1,000 use cases in diverse sectors of economy and industries. And our licensees range from very in innovative startups to very large industrial brands such as Mask, Prologix, and Fujitsu, amongst uh, many more. And here is what Wirepass focuses on. First and foremost, the connectivity. Uh, Wirepass delivers reliable, uh, optimized mesh connectivity. This is delivered in software which consists of the connectivity stack, the open source reference software and associated tools for diagnostic and positioning. Uh, and just for clarity, Wirepass do not produce any hardware. We focus, focus on delivering industrial grade mesh software for massive IoT applications with high reliability and high performance. And last uh, but not least, we do not do this alone and in IoT domain, no company can actually deliver a full end-to-end -end offering. So our go-to-market consists of building strong partnerships so that together with our partners, we can offer turnkey solutions to our customers. Uh, and today we are extremely excited to be with one of our most important ecosystem partners in Singapore, Lantern Edge. So Wirepass, Mesh is designed for massive IoT, and the guiding principles for our design is that the mesh should be high performance and easy to install and provision. Wireless connectivity software, which once embedded in the smart device, caters for very large scale and high density use cases at industrial grade reliability and embeds low power positioning. And here is an overview of uh, Wirepass mesh architecture and what we deliver. Uh, so the Wirepass mesh stack, this is delivered as a binary that you can program to your radio transceiver device. And Wirepass supports 2.4 gigahertz and sub gigahertz bands and runs on multiple radio chipset. And those chipsets are, uh, are um, the, the NRF52 series from Nordic Semiconductors and the EFR32 chip from Silicon Labs. In addition, there are also the choice, choice of modules from our partners like U-Blocks, Fujitsu, LERD, and others, 
who've made the deployment of wirepass mesh on radio devices much easier by removing complexity of starting from chips therefore reducing the time to market for hardware development any device having wirepass mesh binary and the network credentials can join the network and establish upstream downstream and node to node communication and then extend the network coverage by acting as a router for other nodes. Wirepass Mesh is a decentralized network, which means that all the networking decisions are taken by the nodes themselves. And this autonomous behavior is a significant benefit of our technology because it eliminates the need to plan specific routers or network controllers or routing tables. In practice, once wirepass mesh software is embedded in the device there is little to no need for uh, planning commissioning provisioning and ongoing management of the nodes for applications at scale this is a very significant benefit to the cost of ownership and uh, introduces great agility to future changes in the network for instance changes to the scale and the response to adverse effects through self-healing properties so we have a we have an SDK that runs on the radio CPU for application development and we also provide a set of application examples for sensing and asset tracking to get you started so wirepass Linux gateway and cloud APIs are available in open source through wirepass github uh, and you can use them as is or customize them for your own needs. Uh, and we also provide two cloud-based tools, and uh, which is the Wirepass network tool for network diagnostics, topology visualizations, uh, and network health monitoring, and also the Wirepass positioning server, which uh, uses the mesh network information to provide indoor asset localization. Last but not least, Wirepass partners provide a wide range of sensors, tags, and gateway products, as well as software tools and platforms. So our approach results in substantially higher KPIs for our customers, which essentially reduces the cost of designing, developing, operating, and lifecycle management of products and solutions. So you will get market advantages in scalability, density, throughput and battery lifetime of devices, uh, all of which are essential elements of massive IoT implementations. So the applications that we focus on are logistics and asset tracking, and this is a fast growing area. In fact, it is actually booming today. Uh, and here, here Wirepass delivers connectivity for location and end-to-end -end supply chain monitoring. Uh, and this is, by the way, the domain that Lantern Edge has focused their innovation on. And then we have the smart lighting for industrial and commercial buildings where reliability and low latency are the key. Uh, the lighting systems use wirepass for lighting control, but also the lighting becomes a network to collect sensing data or people or asset location in the buildings. And in the industrial domain, our customers and partners use Wirepass to reliably monitor the systems for preventative maintenance and control. And finally, the smart metering is, uh, is actually where we started from. Uh, we is deployed in more than 2 million smart meters in Scandinavia and preparing the next generation of smart meters in India, Indonesia and other markets. So in summary, Wirepass solves the traditional cha challenges of mesh networks by delivering industrial grade reliability with fit for purpose performance at scale and density and low router power consumption, and finally, low commissioning and maintenance costs. So please refer to our website when you can benefit from a range of downloadables, use cases, partner products, and webinars equally the, uh, the, the Wirepass YouTube channel has a multitude of content, video contents, which are easier uh, than just reading papers, and they include quite a lot of use cases from our customers. Uh, and also, I would be happy to provide additional supports for your question 
And at this point, I'd like to call to the stage uh, Jake. And Jake, if I may, I'd like to ask you to take over. And let me just make you the presenter. It's a lot of responsibility. I'm not sure I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Just uh, one second. Okay, perfect. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so for today's uh, discussion, uh, our agenda is to uh, introduce you to Lantern Edge and to discuss the challenges uh, when deploying uh, equipment and solutions into harsh and hazardous environments. I'd like to just briefly cover kind of the journey that we went through to find WirePass and implementing uh, WirePass as part of our solution. And then lastly, talk about uh, our flagship solution, the Lantern Positioning Solution. So uh, Lantern Edge really has uh, kind of split in two. So you have um, the Lantern Positioning Solution, which uh, is a positioning, personnel positioning solution uh, intended to be deployed into harsh environments and uh, environments where you have hazardous areas. Then on the other side, we have a portfolio of standalone hardware products. Um, two different product lines there, Harsh Pro and Hasbro. So uh, I think it's fairly self-explanatory, but uh, Harsh Pro is meant for harsh environments, so indoor and outdoor, that where you would not expect to have hazardous areas. And then uh, Hasbro is intended for uh, hazardous area deployments. Um, I did want to cover, some of you may be curious about the actual name of the company and the name of Lantern itself. So the, the idea or the inspiration for Lantern is that, you know, sites without a positioning solution, uh, we consider them to be dark you, in the sense that you cannot necessarily see where people are. So by deploying Lantern, you have this uh, ability to illuminate your site like a Lantern would, and you can see where everybody is. Uh, the company name itself, Lantern Edge, is a mashup of the Lantern name, but also edge computing, which is where we see the future of edge computing, uh, of computing moving out of data centers and into these harsh and hazardous environments. So now let's go ahead and discuss uh, the challenges of deploying our equipment and solutions into harsh and hazardous environments. So I think everybody has a relatively good idea already of you know what a harsh environment is. Um, you know I think temperature is probably one of these characteristics of a harsh environment that a lot of people can identify with. Um, you know having extreme temperatures, you know very hot or very cold. Um, but it actually it goes deeper than that. It's you know having very wide temperature ranges in you know one particular day or you know over a season having rapidly changing temperatures, you know, there's a lot of uh, underlying characteristics that, that wouldn't necessarily be so obvious. And when you're, when you're deploying equipment, uh, designing equipment, deploying equipment into these sorts of areas, you need to consider these conditions over the lifespan of the product. Uh, another factor to keep in, take into account is that a lot of the equipment that we put in is very remote. So it's actually quite expensive for customers to deploy a you know personnel out into the field to then uh, change that equipment out. So everything that we design is typically very little to no maintenance required, uh, just because we you know this is what our customers expect and demand uh, when you're working in these types of harsh environments. Um, there are other conditions. Um, you know, we we recognize a harsh environment is basically having one or more of the conditions listed on on this particular slide. Um, all sorts of, you know, interesting problems that you wouldn't necessarily expect to find. Um, you know, personally speaking, I've you know run into so many electrical enclosures that are filled with all sorts of bugs and uh, termites and ants, and they do they just wreak havoc on the electronics. So we. <laughs> We do try to uh, plan for these sort of scenarios uh, when we design our products. So uh, maybe not everyone is familiar with what a, a hazardous area or a hazardous environment is. 
So I would um, I would ask everybody to think back to their their first um, science class or their first chemistry class and think about learning about um, combustion or fire. So basically, um, you need three ingredients to have a fire or an explosion when you're referring to gas or vapor. Um, you need a fuel, so you have a gas or vapor. Uh, you have oxygen or an oxidizer, and you have to have an ignition source, which is either you know a hot surface or a spark. Um, actually, when you're referring, uh, dealing with dust, there's actually five ingredients that you need for a dust explosion. But to kind of keep things simple for today, uh, we're just going to be referring to gas uh, type ex explosive environments. <clears throat> So what is actually, what is a hazardous area? So a hazardous area is actually a place where you would expect to find a presence of a combustible dust or gas. And that presence of the gas can either be uh, normal conditions or abnormal conditions. Uh, and it really just depends on, you know, what, um, what's going on in that, in that particular environment. Um, one common example um, of a hazardous environment, I think that everybody would normally interact with, maybe not on a day-to-day -day basis, but quite regularly, would be when you're refueling your vehicle. So the space in the fuel tank above the, you know, the fuel, the gasoline, would be considered a, a hazardous area. Um, the area immediately surrounding the fueling nozzle would also be considered a hazardous area. And in some scenarios, the larger area around the vehicle itself um, in abnormal situations would also be considered a hazardous area. I'll actually uh, elaborate on that further in later slides. And there is uh, one important thing just to remember, uh, which we'll, we'll talk about later. So in order to prevent fire or combustion or an explosion, if you remove one or more of the components of fire, you're able to prevent an explosion. Uh, so if you remove the oxygen, if you remove the ignition source or the fuel or some combination of all three, you're able to prevent explosions. Uh, we'll revisit that one here in a little bit. So where, where do you find hazardous environments, you know, besides your vehicle fuel tank? So, so these are some of the more obvious places, you know, basically anywhere where you're dealing with, uh, you know, hazardous type uh, combustible substances. Um, it really just is anywhere that you're going to be extracting, uh, transporting, storing, or processing substances that are combustible. So that's, a, you know, a gas, a vapor, a dust. Um, some examples of those would be, you know, methane, uh, propane. Um, in terms of dust, you can have wood dust, flour, sugar. If you're machining metals, you can have um, magnesium chips, all sorts of different things. Uh, you can have very a lot of different types of hazardous areas. It just depends on the processes that are going on in that particular place. Okay, so what are the challenges associated with uh, deploying equipment and solutions into hazardous environments. So I would say the first one is actually that, you know, not all hazardous areas are created equal. And what I mean by that is that, so a hazardous area is actually divided into a concept known as zones. Um, so internationally in Europe and everywhere else but America uh, uses the concept called zones. Uh, in the US they use something called the class division system, but for the focus of this presentation, we'll just talk about zones. So uh, when we talked about hazardous areas earlier, we talked about a partial or a continuous presence of, of a combustible atmosphere. And so basically uh, zones, you can have zone zero, zone one, or zone two. So if you have um, a combustible atmosphere present under normal conditions, so you think about your fuel tank scenario in your vehicle, typically you're always going to have fuel in your car. And so inside that tank, you're going to have a continuous presence of uh, a combustible atmosphere under normal conditions because it's normal to have fuel inside of your fuel tank. So over a thousand hours per year. Now, as you're driving your vehicle, you need to refuel the vehicle. And so you're going to have to open up the nozzle to the tank uh, and then you're going to have to refuel it. Um, now, granted that you're not going to have this open for very long but it's, norm, it's a normal situation where you need to open the tank, there's gonna be a combustible atmosphere present, 
um, but it's not necessarily continuous. It's there less amount of time. So it's 10 to say 1,000 hours per year. So that immediate area surrounding your uh, vehicle fuel tank uh, nozzle would be like a zone one. And then let's just say that you get distracted while you're filling up your your uh, your vehicle, and that you overfill the tank, and then that actually now you have a situation that's abnormal, that the tank is now overflowing with uh, gasoline, and then it's spilling onto the ground. So the areas that are abnormal, uh, this would be like zone two. So it's an abnormal situation that you filled the tank, you've overfilled it. Uh, well, hopefully it's abnormal, uh, but then all of those abnormal area areas would be considered zone two. Uh, the next piece of the the hazardous areas not being created equal is the fact that um, you're dealing with different chemicals. Um, so you know if you're in a refinery, you could expect a certain set of chemicals within that particular area. If you're within a wood processing plant, you can expect different chemicals there. And the reason chemicals are considered is that every chemical has a different set of characteristics. So the amount of energy, the ignition energy required to ignite that chemical is taken into account. Um, some chemicals, there's a characteristic called your auto ignition temperature. So some chemicals have a very low auto ignition uh, temperature so that when you're putting equipment into areas with these specific chemicals, the equipment that you specify has to be under that auto ignition temperature. Um, you know, for exa uh, example, there's a chemical called carbon disulfide, disulfide, uh, and it actually will automatically ignite at temperatures over 85 degrees Celsius. So you get into really challenging scenarios with certain chemical types, and then that impacts the type of equipment that you're putting into these specific areas. Uh, the next challenge is that, um, you know, there's very stringent design standards and product certifications. So in Europe, uh, for ha um, hazardous areas, you have a set of standards uh, relating to ATEX certification. So that's a directive in Europe. So everything by law has to be certified uh, to ATEX certifications. And then internationally, you have what's called IECX. Um, like I mentioned previously, the US actually has their own system, uh, but we won't really discuss that today. And so basically, the standards spell out that your equipment needs to be designed using uh, certain protection techniques to avoid creating an explosion. So now, uh, remember a couple slides ago, I had mentioned that if you remove one or more components of your fire triangle, you're able to prevent uh, causing an explosion. So the protection techniques for these types of equipment rely on removing one or more uh, legs of the triangle. So there's really three kind of main areas. So one is segregation. Uh, what that means is that you're basically removing the opportunity for the atmosphere to come into contact with your hot surfaces and electronics. So that could be like uh, you're encapsulating your electronics with some sort of uh, plastic that you can pour in and then uh, nothing can contact the surface. Uh, the next technique is prevention. So prevention is actually designing uh, your product with a lot of redundancy, uh, limiting the amount of energy. So basically, you're designing the product so it's you're never really able to cause a scenario um, where you can cause an explosion. So an example of this would be like intrinsic safety. Um, so you, you're applying a lot of safety factor, you're putting in redundancies there, you're limiting the amount of energy uh, to that can cause an explosion. And then last is actually uh, mitigation. So you're not technically trying to prevent an explosion, but you're actually mitigating the risk of that explosion. So um, this uh, protection technique would be like flame proof. Uh, in the United States, they would call it like explosion proof. They're roughly equivalent, but not quite the same. Uh, but for flame proof, basically you have a really sturdy uh, enclosure. And basically what happens is that if there's an explosion inside of the the in enclosure, it contains that explosion and vents out the gas and cools it down so that it doesn't trigger a, uh, a chain reaction so that it doesn't ignite the outer atmosphere uh, that's surrounding that product. And then the last part is that um, the, the environment themselves, um, the you know hazardous areas are typically found uh, really in like process plants in heavy industrial settings. 
So when you're trying to do deploy and develop equipment for these types of areas, um, you really need to take into account you know, the context of what's going on. So if you're trying to do like a radio solution uh, or having radio as part of your solution, you're going into very unfriendly environments for radio. So you're talking about structural steel, cable trays, pipe racks, tanks, uh, process vessels. There's just, these are all sorts of things that are just, you know, reflecting radio and it's just not a nice place to go uh, in terms of radio. The next part of it is that you know, in some of these process areas, you can expect to find equipment that's actually throwing off a lot of like electrical interference, radio interference, uh, you know, like welding equipment, uh, process ovens, microwave ovens. Uh, so really there's, there's quite a number of different challenges that you have to take into account when you're going into these hazardous environments. Okay, so now, um, I actually wanted to jump over and discuss, you know, our journey that we went on in finding, you know, WirePass and how that went about. So in the early days of this um, solution, you know, we started prototyping. We had our hardware prototypes, uh, and we found an open source uh, protocol stack, technology stack. Uh, I'll use those kind of interchangeably for this presentation uh, to demonstrate our product you know, just for testing internally, showing it to, you know, stakeholders, everything like that. So as we got more and more experience with our hardware and our particular open source uh, technology stack, um, it just, it became more and more apparent that this particular stack was not really suitable for industrial applications. So it only ran off one channel. So if you had interference, it would basically take out your entire network. Um, our, our solution is based on a wearable device. So, you know, workers are having to wear a, a wearable device. Um, this particular protocol, the technology stack, was uh, very inefficient on the radio side. So it just meant that the battery life was just horrendous, um, you know, which is never great because you never want to ask your customers to have to keep, you know, recharging their devices. Nobody likes having to do that. Uh, the next, you know, the, it just really wasn't stable. The communications weren't reliable. And then lastly, and probably most importantly, was that uh, with this particular stack, um, you couldn't really support a large number of devices and a high density of devices. And by density, I mean like, you know, say you have a lot of people standing in a small area, well, it wouldn't be able to support that. So, you know, all these things were becoming apparent. And then finally, we're just like, okay, um, we're going to, we're faced with a build versus buy decision here. So we can either try and build this thing from scratch um, or we can try and buy or license some stack that's available. And that's what really uh, kicked off the search. So as part of the search, um, you know, we did have some requirements. So we are pretty far along in our hardware design process. Um, you know, we didn't want to really throw out our designs. We'd, we'd ideally like to be able to use what we had. So that was one, it was basically whatever we, whatever technology we found would have to be a drop in replacement. And then the next piece is that uh, the technology needed to be mature. So, you know, ideally when you're migrating to a new technology, uh, when it's all happy days, it should solve all your problems and not create new ones. So uh, we didn't want to jump to another technology and then just unlock another can of worms to, you know, say to, uh, you know, create a whole bunch of other problems. It's totally not what we wanted. So immediately while we're, you know, looking around, uh, Wireless Heart and ISA 100 uh, both came up. You know, I have a background in, pop, um, in industrial automation. You know, I was already familiar with these technologies. Um, so I started looking around, but, you know, there really weren't any licensable stacks on the market. Okay, yeah, there were some modules already preloaded with it, but it, they just didn't offer the flexibility that we really needed for our particular solution. And then also, um, as more time went on, um, you know, we identified constraints with the technology and it really just, um, it wasn't appropriate for what we are trying to do for our particular solution. So finally, uh, you know, we, we came across WirePass and, you know, we did a very intensive internal evaluation. Um, our hardware was compatible uh, immediately or straight out of the box. So, you know, uh, Bafa in his presentation mentioned the chipsets that were compatible. So we had we had chosen a chipset that was already compatible. So that was good news. And um, 
overall everything was was uh, compatible. So that that was great. You know, we spoke with Vafa and Sebastian uh, in great detail, and the overall Wirepass team. And you know, eventually we made the decision to partner with Wirepass, and it's been a very, I would say, smooth transition from our old technology to our new one. So why, you know, why do we really love Wirepass? So Wirepass, I would say, pretty much single-handedly addressed most of the problems, uh, if not all of them, uh, single-handedly. And so, you know, all these, you know, I won't go too technical, but, you know, the Wirepass was able to provide us resistance to, to interference. Um, we're able to have many more devices communicating in the same area. The battery life on our wearable device went up significantly. Um, over, uh, I'd say roughly 100%. So it, it was actually quite dramatic. Um, the end-to-end -end communications was much more reliable, but then outside of the technical, the documentation and support uh, was very good. So a lot better. You know, I'm I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with working with open source uh, code bases, but sometimes documentation is non-existent, which can be very frustrating, particularly if you're trying to get a solution to market very quickly. Uh, and then last, actually, the the ecosystem that Wirepass provides. You know, Vafa's always uh, playing matchmaker, you know, he's always putting us in touch with uh, with all sorts of different people who are interested in Wirepass, other Wirepass licensees. So it's actually one of the more vibrant ecosystems that I've uh, participated in in the past. So it's it's been very good. And then lastly, you know, why, why do we love Wirepass? So ultimately what Wirepass enables us to do is focus. Um, so focus is so important. So it lets us focus on developing solutions and features that unlock value for our clients you know when we set out on this uh on this project on this uh solution i should say we didn't necessarily want to become a mesh networking protocol stack technology developer uh, we wanted we had a very specific goal uh, that we wanted to meet so wirepass has enabled us to do that okay so now i would like to go ahead and talk about the Lantern positioning system. So the use case, um, you know, behind the Lantern positioning system. So industrial workplaces, you know, are required by law to carry out uh, muster drills, headcount drills. So depending on what industry you're in, uh, everybody kind of has a different name for it. So our particular use case is actually driven by drilling for oil and gas, uh, particularly in parts of the world where you have a lot of hydrogen sulfide. So if you're not familiar with what hydrogen sulfide is, it's a colorless gas, it's flammable, it smells like rotten eggs, uh, it's extremely corrosive, uh, but worse yet, it's actually very, very toxic and deadly in low concentrations. Uh, so, you know, pretty it's actually really just really not great stuff um, currently today so as people are running uh, muster or these headcount drills it's all largely manually driven so if you're on a site um, basically you start a muster drill you're waiting you really don't know where somebody is uh, or the fact that they're missing until the muster has already elapsed for a few minutes so immediately by running muster drills in the current way, you don't know where people are for minutes or, you know, depending on how uh, large your site is, it could be much longer. Uh, the next challenge is that, so when you're in these, uh, you know, hazardous areas, these process plants, oil rigs, you're in these very densely obstructed environments. Um, and so there, it, basically immediately rules out the usage of GPS or, you know, GNSS, like uh, Galileo, if you're in Europe, you know, something like that, uh, for two reasons. So one is that if you're surrounded by tall process equipment, it's obstructing your view of the sky, so you can't see enough satellites. And the second part is that even if you do, the quality is not great because you've got multipath bouncing off uh, all of the equipment everywhere. So what you do get is basically unusable. The next challenge is that, you know, yes, okay, there are a lot of uh, localization positioning systems on the market, but there's very few uh, that actually suited the requirements 
um, that are hazardous area rated. So that was a specific challenge. And then just revisiting hydrogen sulfide, I had mentioned earlier that actually it's extremely corrosive. So not only is it deadly, but you also need to protect your equipment from this particular, you know, this particular compound because it will actually corrode the printed circuit boards in your electronics if you don't take preventative action. Um, so when we're designing this in mind, uh, we needed something very flexible. Um, so the drilling, drilling for oil is pretty much a, a project-oriented business. So they move a rig in, you got to rig it up, rig it down, uh, and then they'll move it, you know, depending on how deep a well is or how, how many wells they're actually drilling off a single well pad, dip, uh, dictates how long they're spending at site. So we needed something that was easy to rig up and rig down, um, but just as easily it could be permanently installed. So it's kind of part of being easy to rig up and rig down. We needed as little cabling as possible. Um, and that's what really pushed the mesh networking, uh, say, requirement there, is that by using mesh networking, you're able to self-form a network. You're able to cut out uh, a good a good portion of your cabling requirements, uh, which was definitely a, a really nice benefit there. And then the last part was that you need to support, you know, uh, scalable sites. So you might have a site with tens of people, or you could go up to a site with thousands of people. And just to give a you know a concept of size, the project that I was on in Singapore, the Exxon Mobil Singapore Parallel Train Project, which is a polyethylene plant among other things, um, at peak headcount there were 25,000 people on site uh, in one day. So you know you're talking about there's some very very large sites out there. Okay, so the goals for the, the system itself, there's really two main goals. Um, so in emergency situations, by providing personnel position information, uh, we're, we want to be able to improve uh, first response times. So sending out your HSE guys, your first responders, your fire guys, uh, and you know if you know that somebody's in danger, they're not moving, you can see that you've started a muster drill, uh, they haven't moved, then you can target those people and go after them you can see where people are in their, their last known location. And the second piece is um, productivity. So you have to run these drills, uh, you know, in non-emergency scenarios, you have to run these draw, uh, drills for compliance reasons. So, you know, anytime that you're able to speed up the, the compliance drill, well, that's gonna save you money. Um, for context, you know, if, again, if you're not familiar with the oil and gas business, you know, drilling rigs, uh, you, you lease them out on a day rate. And so depending on whether the, the rig is on land or it's offshore, uh, there's a lot of different uh, kind of factors that go into the price. But if you're looking at say like an offshore rig, uh, a jack up rig, that's the one that has the like, kind of like the scissor legs and it can jack itself up uh, over the water. Something like that as of May, 2020 was running about $80,000 per day. Whereas if for like a larger, uh, a larger rig like a semi-submersible or a drill ship, you're looking at up to $200,000 per day. So even if you're able to just shave minutes off and you're doing this over time, it does add up to substantial savings. So I wanted to show the solution, the kind of the building blocks of our solution to give you a little bit of context uh, that you can identify with what we're talking about. So on the left-hand side, you see the lantern tag, so that's our wearable device. The Harsh Pro Link is the it's a mesh networking router, uh, IP66. So I'll I'll talk about all this in further detail later on. Uh, but this is meant for safe areas. And then we have our Hasbro Link, which is in a flameproof enclosure. As you can see, that's meant for hazardous areas. And then we have our Harsh Pro server, which is actually completely fanless, uh, Intel Xeon D based server that you can actually just put it into an unair conditioned C container somewhere, and then you know you can do what you need to do at site, no internet connection required. And then lastly, we have our software. So the way that this works is that you know each worker that you want to have uh, positioning data on is assigned a tag. So that tag, uh, you know, they're wearing it, and then that tag is then sending out position updates uh, periodically. So Typically, we set it for 30 seconds, although this can be programmed to, to change. Um, you know, at site, you don't, it doesn't have to be programmed at the factory, so you can actually tailor that to, to your site requirements. 
uh, you have a combination of HarshPro and HasPro links at your site to build out your mesh network. Uh, as soon as you power them on, they self-form the network. So there's no, you know, no IT, no networking, nothing like that. It's just a matter of you just plug it in, and as long as they're within range of each other, your network will build itself. So as a tag is sending out uh, position updates, it will communicate with the network. It sends that information through the mesh network to our servers. So our servers actually have a, a M2 radio. So I, unfortunately, that, that was not shown in our previous slide. Um, the M2 radio enables the server to function as a mesh network gateway. So we're able to uh, communicate with the mesh network, get position information from our tags, and then the, the servers are actually running the software as well and the algorithms. So they're able to take this position information from the tag and generate a position update. And then we're able to show that a live update on our software. So one thing I would like to highlight right here in this slide is that actually uh, when we designed the solution, we took into account that you know oil rigs aren't necessarily located where you have a really nice high speed internet connection. Um, you may have satellite available, but it would be very expensive. So the idea is that you can run this solution uh, completely on premise, completely at your site, all the servers there, no maintenance required, and uh, just so that you don't require a connection to the cloud. Now, um, that does, uh, just to add though, that if you do have a connection to the cloud, you that does unlock additional functionality. So say you're an operator or a driller, or a petrochemical plant uh, operator that you have multiple sites within a particular region or even across the world having the internet connection to those sites then enables you to get a 30,000 foot view of your operations globally regionally wherever that may be so this slide is just to illustrate that you know uh, you have a combination of the HarshPro and HasPro links, and this builds out your, your mesh network at your facility. So Lantern is really the first use case. Having this mesh network uh, infrastructure in place actually enables you to do new applications. So now that you have this mesh network, you can use it to read uh, instrument information from wirepass enabled devices. And then conversely, you can actually control devices, you know, like lighting or relays, motors, whatever, you know, whatever type of controls that you would like to do with that, that then becomes a possibility. Okay, so this slide is just uh, to discuss the, the Harsh and Hasbro links themselves. So actually both devices are uh, rated IP66, which means that they're dust proof and they're water resistant. Uh, they're resistant to being sprayed with strong jets. So the, the devices, the Hasbro link itself is hazardous area rated, so it's got a flame-proof enclosure, but it's also got a, a intrinsically safe radio output. So if you ever wanted to change uh, the antenna or anything like that, you could actually just change the antenna with a, a cold permit. You wouldn't need a hot work permit. You don't even have to take the device offline because it is uh, intrinsically safe on the radio output. So as part of the, the, uh, the requirement that when we were building this was that uh, we needed to reduce the amount of cabling. So you can install this as permanent infrastructure with a DC line. Uh, we also do have uh, electrical accessories, an external battery or an EX rated PV or solar system so that you could truly install this as a, a truly standalone mesh networking infrastructure where you don't have to worry about power supplies, cabling, installation, scaffolding, all that kind of stuff. The next is Lantern, the Lantern Tag. So this is a wearable device. So it's battery operated, uh, wirelessly charged. Um, the the typical way wearing methods are, you know, you can either wear it with a clip or a lanyard. It really, you know, we provided multiple options because everybody's HSC policies are slightly different. You know, some people may not allow uh, even a breakaway lanyard. So we do have a clip that uh, will come with the device. Um, and also, uh, I did want to highlight, so the, the device is intrinsically safe. Um, we're good for hydrogen, so that's group uh, 2C for gas, and even 3C for dust. So we're good for zone zero, which is uh, really nice. Um, but I, thought, I think it's really cool that actually the, the enclosure of the device itself is actually designed uh, you know, to standard so that the enclosure actually is made of a specific material to dissipate static electricity. 
So a lot of work really goes into the, the design of these of our products. Um, okay, and then lastly, uh, the last piece of the software. So you're able to open up our software from a web browser on the same local area network at your site. And you're able to get a live view of your personnel across your site um, on private maps. So you, that means like you don't have to, you can put your maps onto the server. That information doesn't have to go to the cloud. So all your, your map schematics, site plots, all that stuff, it's kept there at site. Um, you're able to host personnel records. So again, from a, a data privacy perspective, everything is kept there locally. You're not putting anything into the cloud. Uh, so that, that those are actually really nice features there because data data protection is becoming more and more prevalent in our in our daily lives. So with the software, you're able to set up um, what we call go or no go zones. So if somebody who's wearing a tag wanders into an area that they're not authorized for, you'll get a pop up notification. You have an alternate view, what we call occupancy. So you're able to actually see the the number of people throughout the site. Uh, in the areas that you've already defined. Uh, you can even set uh, levels like a maximum or minimum occupancy level uh, on particular areas. So say for instance, you have the, the smoke shop and you don't want more than five people in there at a time. Um, and now it's particularly relevant in the COVID world is that you can actually set these maximum occupancy limits so not to exceed it. And if it does, then you get a notification. Uh, conversely, if you have like a high security area you can set a minimum occupancy limit, and that if that if it goes below your limit, you will get a notification on that. Uh, you're able to uh, manage all the devices, so you can upload firmware. You know, say we're pushing out updates, uh, you can do that remotely. You don't need to bring the devices in from the field. Everything can be done over the air. Uh, we have reporting features like time spent on site. So as soon as somebody uh, walks onto your site, starts logging how much time they spent on site, and then you can get a daily, monthly report. Uh, report that's up to you and then lastly uh, you have the feature to, to conduct automated muster drills um, but I, I would like to talk about uh, the last piece is actually the extensibility of our software is that our software has been architected in such a way that it's actually very easy for us to incorporate data from third-party systems so that could be you know other process control systems weather systems fire and gas anything that has an interface that you can potentially get data out of and why that's really interesting is that now you have context on where people are throughout your sites uh, so you can do some really interesting things. So just for example, a use case that I uh, that we talk about a lot is that you know where, say for instance, you have a fire and gas system, you have uh, H2S instruments all throughout your, your site, so you know where those H2S instruments are, so that if one starts triggering, you know where that is located, you can then actually compare that to where people are in you know relative position to that sensor. You can further incorporate weather information um, you know, say you have a weather station there at your site, you can see which way the wind is blowing. So then you can get into, you know, probabilistic models about which way a gas plume is going, and then you can see where people are, are at risk. So there's a really a lot of different and interesting use cases there, and it's really just uh, limited by, you know, what information that you can get access to. So it's actually pretty exciting. So this is actually, that, that wraps up everything for the Lantern positioning system. I did want to end this slide, uh, end this presentation with, you know, if you're here today um, looking to develop your own solutions, um, I would welcome you to have a conversation with us. We have hardware that's, uh, that's ready to go. You know, by working with us, we're able to reduce your time to market. You don't have to go to the trouble of setting up your own hardware supply chain. Uh, so by partnering with somebody who's already you know, been through all these, uh, I don't want to say headaches, that'd be a big, <laughs> um, so, but definitely we would, we'd be interested to have a conversation with you if you are looking to do, to develop your own solution. And if you're interested, uh, please visit our website uh, for more information. And yeah, um, that is it for me. Thank you everybody for listening. Um, and I guess Vafa, do Thanks I hand very it over much, to you? Jake. That was a fantastic uh, presentation, and uh, I guess you know you, you kind of simplified the the hard job that you guys have uh, have done in um, over over a long period. But uh, 
it looks fantastic. And of course, there is a number of questions. We've got a, a couple of minutes to cover the questions. Before I go into the questions, I also wanted to get everyone uh, focused. If you would uh, like to download any of the handouts, they're all available. Uh, and we are um, we have a number of questions, but if you have more, uh, be happy to to answer them. So so the first uh, question is, uh, and I think Jack, this is yours. Uh, what is the mode of M to M communication in between the nodes? Is it LoRa WAN? Uh, no, so it's actually it is WirePass. So. Um, all of our devices uh, communicate on the 2.4 gigahertz ISM band, um, but it, it's using the WirePass protocol. So LoRaWAN is actually a separate uh, protocol or technology altogether. Great. So the next one is also for you. Uh, what is the difference between the Harsh Pro and Has Pro links? Is it only the hardware design? So the the devices themselves are actually quite similar. The only difference is that the uh, Hasbro link is actually hazardous area rated. So we've taken the same electronics, uh, but they go into what's called a flame-proof enclosure, which enables you to put that then into a hazardous area. And we're rated up to zone one. Uh, so you can go into a zone one hazardous uh, hazardous area with a temperature class of T4, which is 135 degrees. So that uh, that that will let you know kind of like what chemicals you're able to work uh, with this equipment with. Fantastic. Uh, next one, uh, also for you, uh, Jack, you're getting quite a lot of interest. So what is the range of the tag and have you done any sort of testing in, 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 the, in the number of trials that you have already performed? Um, so actually we, we do split it up. Um, so we have link to link range and we have tag to link range. Um, so specifically the, the tag to link range uh, is roughly 100 meters. So it, there is something to note though. So um, Wirepass, you know, as a protocol uh, or technology stack will actually retry. So if it's not successful uh, at transmitting once, it will continually retry for that. So you can actually stretch that out a little bit further if you need to uh, because of this retry mechanism. Okay. Uh, does Lantern Tag also offer solutions for real-time sensory data transfer from multiple oil and gas equipment to cloud, or are you only focused on personal positioning system? Uh, Which the, I guess it would, was your previous slide with the, the extensibility. Yeah, so we can we can definitely bring in uh, data from third-party systems. You know. Um, process control systems, fire and gas, you know, anything where you either have, say, like a, a Modbus interface, a Profibus, you know, any, whether that's Ethernet or running over RS-45, um, or it's a, you know, if it's a newer system that has APIs, REST APIs, anything like that, we can bring into the system uh, to combine that information. Fantastic. So we might be running a little bit over time. Is it okay, Jake, to go a few minutes before um, we get chopped out? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so what is the weight in, in grams of the Lantern tag, if you can remember that? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Uh, hold on one second. I think it's uh, roughly 85 grams. 85 grams. So it's quite, I mean, it's transportable by uh, people without really uh, weigh, weighing them down. Yes, okay. we, we definitely did want to bog people down. It's hard enough working on sites. You got to carry around hard hats, drawings, everything, radios. So we didn't want to make it too heavy. Absolutely. Uh, any challenges faced with positioning systems specific to hazardous environments? I guess the question could be interpreted as, uh, you know, I guess, you know, there is there is everything that radio doesn't like in terms of, you know, hostility of the environment, you know, dust, uh, uh, reflection, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 
Um, could you talk maybe a little bit about the challenges? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I think you kind of nailed it actually. So, you know, in these uh, radio unfriendly environments, um, specifically what I mean is that you have a very reflective environment. So if you think about back to uh, maybe physics, you have a law of superposition. So you have uh, spots that would look um, higher signal or they look lower signal depending on the reflection. Uh, and that's just one of the challenges of you know working in these types of environments. Excellent. And um, I, I just wanted to put up, uh, because I know there's quite a lot of questions we might not have uh, time to cover, but uh, it seems like there is quite a lot of interest in, um, in um, Jake's presentation and the lantern positioning. So please, uh, please uh, uh, sort of feel free to contact Jake. But uh, for the next few minutes, uh, uh, so what specific X-related challenges Wirepass technology helped you to resolve? And I think uh, you've gone, you, you covered that in your, uh, you know, in your roadmap to, to Wirepass solution, but if you could just talk uh, a, a couple of the, the headlines, you know, the, the, the challenges that Wirepass actually helped you to, um, to, to recover from. Um, so I guess not to go too technical, but so Wirepass actually uses uh, time slot channel hopping, whereas our previous technology uses something called a channel channel collision, where basically, um, let's just say that you have a, a group of tags all within a, a same area. Um, it's not really a coordinated procedure to communicate. Um, basically, it's everybody trying to talk all at the same time, but the rule is that you have to listen before you talk, and the only time that you can talk is that uh, nobody else is talking. So ultimately, what this results in is that all of our devices are all listening for very long periods of time, and that's, you know, even just turning on the receiver on your device is burning up energy. Um, so if you're able to reduce the amount of time that the devices are listening, you're able to save a lot of uh, power consumption. So basically with, with time slot channel hopping is that think about yourself sitting in a room with a group of other people, you're able to synchronize, uh, you're all wearing watches that are you know fairly precise and you're able to synchronize the time. So uh, the person I'm sitting next to, he's gonna talk at 12.01, the next person talks at 12.02, the next person talks at 12.03. So then basically what happens is that, okay, well, I know that I'm gonna speak at 12.05, I'm gonna go to sleep until that very moment at 12.04.59, and then I'm gonna wake up and send my information and I'm gonna go immediately back to sleep. And in that way, I'm able to save much more energy. Um, and then I would say the other thing is that Wirepass is able to operate on multiple channels. So our previous technology was single channel only, Whereas Wirepass, I believe, has 40 channels, 39, 40, something like that. So you're, if you're having problems within a specific area of your site, um, you don't actually have to go through and manually change the channels yourself. It's all inherent to the protocol. The protocol is just taking care of all that underlying stuff for you. Um, so that okay. was definitely, uh, definitely important. So does the battery lifetime have any impact if the pings from the tags are sent more frequently or reduced to say 10 seconds instead of 30 seconds? Uh, yes. So, so yes. In, anytime that you're using your uh, radio more frequently, uh, you're definitely going to have a, a trade-off there in battery life. And um, so this is a question about your perform uh, the performance of Wirepass stack. So what is the downtime rate or efficiency of Wirepass monthly or annually, if you have those figures? Uh, actually, I don't. I don't. Um, I don't have that information available. Sorry. Okay. What is the accuracy of location? Uh, we try to be on par with GPS, uh, it's say roughly five to 10 meters, um, but it's highly dependent on the amount of links that you deploy onto your site. So we uh, we actually use uh, trilateration 
as our positioning algorithm. So if you have uh, three uh, links, then that helps you get a more accurate position on your site. I see. And the last one, uh, Jake, since we are uh, now seriously over time, is that uh, you shown on your slide that you have a Hosh Pro server. Does this server need to be installed in Zone 1 or Zone 2 location? If so, do you have any Hasbro servers? Uh, we do not have Hasbro servers at the moment. Actually, the server that you've seen is uh, safe area rated, so it is not hazardous area rated. Although we do have the Hasbro server on our roadmap, and that's something that we're actually currently working on. Fantastic. I think the, now, now that we're a couple of minutes over time, so I just wanted to thank uh, Jake and Jacqueline from Lantern Edge. Uh, I wanted to also thank uh, my colleague Rika in, uh, in Finland, who's helped us uh, put this webinar together. And But uh, most of the thanks goes to the attendees. Many thanks for your questions, and if you have any further queries, Jake and I are both uh, available. You, you see our um, uh, email addresses and contact details here, uh, and it's been a fantastic uh, privilege to have you all uh, have your attention on, uh, on our content. Any departing um, uh, comments? Jake? Uh, no, I just thanks for everybody uh, listening today. Thanks to Jack for her help supporting and thanks to everybody at BigMind for the hard work and you know thanks yeah thanks again for everybody uh, taking time out of the day to listen and thanks okay, to you thanks Vafa for... and Waterpass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay be safe everybody and uh, we hopefully see you in other forms uh, through other means. Thank you. Bye.